of the that you can present here. And uh, so please, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, so um, the, <clears throat> the title of this uh, session is uh, Conformal Prediction in Orange. Um, and first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Lars and colleagues to, to invite us uh, to this conference. Uh, I may say I know the venue as well, and I'm really sorry that uh, I, I mean, we couldn't uh, be uh, on site. Um, uh, so, but all right, um, Zoom. Um, so uh, we're gonna break this uh, into two sessions. Uh, the conformal prediction talk will actually be by Tomas. So I, I won't talk, maybe I'm gonna mention conformal prediction in the first part, um, um, but uh, so those of you that are really interested in conformal prediction, right? Uh, um, you're gonna have to wait for, uh, for about an hour, or a bit less actually. Um, what I'm gonna talk about uh, is actually communication in data science. Um, so the idea here is that uh, um, anytime we apply, I don't know, either machine learning or, or data analysis, we, we need to talk with, with domain experts or we need to communicate not only with domain experts, but we need to share the results in in some way or the other. Um, I actually started uh, uh, a while ago. I mean, I, I started doing machine learning in um, late 90s and I was, uh, um, I was involved with, uh, I mean, with, in some research um, where uh, on the other side, the main experts were for medicine. And it turned out at that time that um, you know, the, the physician comes and then, uh, so you analyze the data. They usually don't have much time, first of all. They can spare maybe 10, 15 minutes and then they have to go uh, for some other, I mean, to maybe in the operating room, right? Um, and um, also they're not the experts in, um, in any kind of programming or any kind of, um, any kind of uh, um, computer science, right? So the communications with them was at that time really difficult uh, because either was uh, on paper, right? We would show some graphs that were printed out, right? Or was by programming. And they, if we use programming, they got bored because that took some time and uh, the results came every few minutes and uh, um, it wasn't good. So both the paper was, you know, the, the results were static and, uh, um, and programming was tedious because they don't look, I mean, they're not interested in looking the code. Um, so, in, I mean, then, I don't know, more than 20 years later, right? Um, we can, I think now boil down, not, not just, I mean, Tomas and me, right? But, but actually the community can boil down um, to things that if you want to have this communication fluent and if you'd like to uh, um, engage the audience and the data owners, there are certain things that you have to do, right? Uh, and I'm going, I'm going to boil down to, I actually have these five bullets here. Um, so first of all, I claim that um, um, to engage the audience and to really, um, to, to ena enable the communica communication, we have to have interactive data analysis. Um, and I'll, I'll try to explain what this is. I mean, interactive doesn't mean that you push the buttons, but it's something else actually. So I, I, I need to be concrete. Um, I also claim that uh, uh, in order for this, um, um, for, for the data analysis to be flexible, uh, uh, we need to have a workflows. Uh, we need to define the workflows. Of course, you can define the workflows through, through scripting, um, but it would be great to see the workflow actually visually. Um, and then we all know now the explanation is all important, but not only the explanation of results, um, but of the data, <clears throat> but of the data mining process, right? So the, the data mining process has to be has to be clear um, and has to be explainable in a sense that I can actually, when I look at it, I can tell the story of how uh, I mean what happened from the input of the data to the result. Um, I'm also gonna uh, just I'm also gonna demonstrate that if you have these workflows and uh, really nice components, right? you can actually um, use some really standard things uh, uh, to explain the results uh, of, let's say, clustering, right? You don't need, uh, because we are in the age where this explanation in um, AI is so important and it's uh, one of the major research efforts now, right? 
um, this was always so. I mean, in the, the way when, when I, okay, I remember 20 years back, right? Explanation was all important in machine learning. And I'm just claiming that uh, we don't need too many fancy tools uh, to construct, I mean, to, to actually explain um, uh, the, the results of the data mining or, or modeling. And this, this is not a subject that was just invented uh, uh, like in the couple, past couple of years, but it spans, I mean, since people have talked about machine learning uh, or statistics or explorative data analysis, explanation was always there. Um, um, I also claim that if you have these three components, um, so, so the interactive data analysis workflows or what, what I rather like to say, Lego bricks for data mining, and then also this means of explaining the things, right? This is all great for education and training. And I'm gonna just briefly talk uh, about that. Uh, and then I'm gonna touch base of why, whatever I told you so far, right? Uh, this actually dem democratizes data science um, in a sense that um, um, democratization of data science means that uh, can people, other than just data scientists, can they do some data analysis and can they use machine learning or can they use uh, uh, some fancy stuff without really knowing the uh, intricacies of the algorithms and um, so some people don't like it when I say this, but without going into deep statistics, right? Uh, of course, I'm, I mean, I'm fully aware that when you report the results, you really have to be stringent on the statistics and so on, but the data, right, is often so beautiful that even without uh, deep knowledge about statistics, uh, you can actually see some patterns and uh, um, find, join them. So, okay, uh, enough of my slides. So um, I'll just, um, I'm gonna go now. Um, I mean, oh, of course you can uh, break for any questions just uh, or, or stop me anywhere, right? But now I'd like to show you what I mean with, uh, so maybe just bring it back. Uh, what I mean by this, um, these five bullets, right? Uh, let's start with interactive data analysis um, because I, I well, um, and I, I won't define it. I'll just show what I mean, right? Um, so say, I don't know, maybe I'll start, uh, we, we always start with the data, right? So maybe I'll start with, um, um, uh, some historical data from, it's called the zoo data set, basically. Uh, it has uh, 101, uh, well, I shouldn't comment here. I just should show the data, right? So um, so I'm, I'm loading the data here and then I'm presenting uh, this data in a spreadsheet, right? Um, and um, this is just like, it's just a, I don't know, a data table, right? So here I see that I have, uh, some animals, um, um, this was actually, uh, it's a really old data set uh, at the beginning of the machine learning, somebody where the data sets were uh, scarce, somebody actually typed this down, right? Um, so there's, I don't know, um, okay, there's a crayfish, right? Uh, and uh, that somebody also sort of like sorted these animals into types, uh, um, so, uh, and we see that uh, here's a description, right? So crayfish does not have hair, does not have feathers, has uh, lace eggs, uh, doesn't give milk, right? It's not airborne, it's aquatic and so on, right? So, so what I have now in, uh, this is typical machine learning setting, right? I have, uh, I have in my rows, uh, basically I have objects of interest in the columns, I have uh, features. Uh, and because in machine learning, uh, the row, right? The object um, is the object of interest, right? Uh, here in this table, I can actually select the objects, right? Um, you can say, oh, I, I don't know, maybe I can sort this out, right? And say, oh, select few birds, right? Um, or I have uh, fish and so on, right? Um, so, okay, you can see that, uh, I mean, this is like sort of boring interaction, right? But so, I'm having this data table which is, which is interactive. Interactive, I don't, not by means of uh, defining some settings, but by means of selection uh, of the rows, right? This is very basic, uh, very basic interaction. It also means, right, that uh, if I have, if I stick here another data table, right, uh, um, this software that I'm using actually um, figures out that uh, uh, whatever I select here, 
uh, is going to be sent. So from this data table is going to be sent to the data table one, right? So basically, what I'm having here, right, um, is whatever I select here is shown here. Okay. And I don't know if I would be in a class here or in, in the audience, I would ask you whether this is um, is this useful, right? That I'm showing only. So I'm selecting things here, interactively selecting things here and showing it here. Is that, I don't know, I'm, who should I ask? Lars, is that useful or not? Well, Lars is nobody here alive actually. Tomas, do you find this useful or not? Well, I find it useful because I know how to use it on in, in orange. <laughs> yeah, but I would say it's completely useless because here I already see the selection here. Why should I repeat it here, right? Um, so I don't know, I, it didn't convince me here. So I, this particular combination is not really useful, right? Um, but it would be useful uh, in some other way. Can anybody tell me how this would be useful, let's say? So maybe if you you don't need to to interact uh, and you let some algorithm to choose. Well, you can do that as well, right? You can I don't know construct a classification tree or, or clustering and then choose the instances. Oh, we may do that as well, right? Uh, well, let's do that, right? Uh, so okay, I didn't convince you that this is too useful, right? But I'm going to actually show you what when it will be useful. So I'm going to remove uh, this data table here and what Jose said, right? Is that um, um, maybe I should construct some uh, something, some model, right? And that model may have some more interesting interactions. And let's do that in a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, maybe I can do clustering, right? So for clustering, I'm going to use Hareka clustering and I'm going to measure the distances first. Euclidean distance is just fine here. Uh, oh, by the way, so um, uh, this software actually changes uh, the, the ordinary or Ordinal, the, the non numerical values by one hot encoding and then does Euclidean. So it does that uh, automatically. Uh, and um, maybe Hareka clustering here, right? So this is the Hareka clustering of, um, of my data, right? Um, so maybe I should zoom out, right? Um, so can anybody tell me whether this clustering, right? So and and I'm I'm lucky because somebody actually I mean usually I would not have uh, the type of the animals assigned but maybe I would try to discover it right but uh, anybody telling me whether is this does this clustering looks um, okay or sensible or how many groups do I have here. Okay, I'll, I'll answer then, well, if nobody, or maybe Jose. Do, do yeah, maybe this? two groups, no? Two, two major groups, no? Yeah, there are two major groups, right? So I can cut it here, right? Or maybe there are three, yeah, four, three right? Yeah. Maybe four, yeah, yeah. okay. Well, which is interesting, right? All the fish are in the group, right? Uh, and birds, right? And there's a reptile, right, um, here. And then all the mammals are here in this group, right? So, um, so this makes sense, but it, Turns out that uh, insects and invertebrates, right? And there's uh, there are some reptiles here. It's hard. So based on these data, it's hard, hard to distinguish it, right? Okay, here's another case where I find um, interactivity important, right? I would like to know what this reptile is, right? Um, obviously, I I can select a group, right? So I have two birds and a reptile. Um, so uh, and I know that I, I I don't know if you got the feeling so far, but Anything, any component that I use, right? If I select something, then uh, the selection comes to the output of this component. So maybe I, if I can include the data table here, right? So I'm reusing, uh, I'm reusing this component data table, right? Uh, uh, I see that um, the reptile is actually tortoise, which is, well, that's an outlier, right? Um, I usually, and it's with, with two birds, right? Well, why is tortoise here with birds? 
why do you think? I mean, just looking at this. So we are now already in sort of like explaining uh, something about this clustering. Why do you think uh, this is the case? So interestingly, right, it lists X, okay? So, and the other features uh, look very, so the, actually the profile of the tortoise is very much like uh, flamingo and ostrich. Okay, this is why they were clustered together, right? There are some differences. Um, the tortoise does not have any feathers, right? But other, in the, um, uh, okay, flamingo is airborne, but ostrich is not, right? So, and, but other things are pretty simple, pretty similar, right? So here's another um, here's another way of interacting, right? So what, what I'm what what I, what I would like to say, interactive data analysis, is that all visualizations should be interactive, right? So whatever I choose here, right, um, uh, I should actually be able to. So so I I mean, if this is the clustering model, right? Uh, whatever I choose here should go to the output of Hareka clustering, right? Uh, and I'm able now to explain, I mean, to, to explore um, what is on the output. So basically this is, these four, right? Are dolphin, purpose, seal, sea lion. Um, that's also interesting because this, um, these guys are actually, I mean, they're swimming. They're basically, they're fish, right? Um, and they're mammals as well, right? And they cluster together. Okay. There are other things that we can do with this, um, I mean, other things that we can do with these interactions, right? So basically in Hareka clustering, whatever I choose, right, um, gets sense to the output, right? But um, maybe there are some other more, um, I mean, the, in this way, I can see what is in each cluster, right? Going back to the data, uh, showing the data table, but maybe I can do something else. And what I'm actually um, quite fond of, um, um, lately are the two-dimensional uh, projections and embeddings. So, so what I really like, and I, I think this also, ref I mean, this goes for any kind of data, is that the question, can I present all my data in two dimensions? Um, why would that be good? Well, in two dimensions, um, so we human are used to um, look at things on the maps, right? We like the maps um, because we can then draw conclusions um, about groups on the maps and so on, right? Uh, so, so, uh, so the question is how, how do we construct such maps, right? Uh, there's one um, particular algorithm that's called multidimensional scaling. Um, and um, maybe I should uh, say, no. If I show the labels, the names, right, it's gonna be crowded because some of them, well, maybe I should jitter it a little bit, right? Okay. So this is my, um, this is my map of uh, this animal kingdom, right? Um, and I, I really like the maps. I mean, especially lately actually, because not, not, not only because of multi-dimensional scaling, but other techniques, right? Uh, so, um, and I mean, I don't know. Um, can you? Can anybody comment on this map? Is that uh, so? We already said the Hareka clustering makes sense, right? Uh, does this map make sense, and why? Uh, can any, anybody can can comment here? So I may ask Jose, right? But anybody else? <laughs> uh, I mean, it seems kind of intuitive. I look just looking at is one in uh, each cluster. Yeah, you will. intuitive maybe because the the things of the same color are together, right? There are some there are some um, exceptions here, right? So so you can see that uh, this group here, right? Um, oh, sorry, this group here. Well, I should not should not move my mouse. Um, okay. Yeah, sorry for this. I'm working with uh, uh, on a machine that's actually ten years old. And uh, let's go back. So basically, the the um, 
let me let me turn off the jittering uh, and uh, well, let me turn on the jittering. So basically, what we see right is that uh, the animals of the same of the same type stuck together, and there are some exceptions here. I have a uh, house fly moth and wasp wasp here, and then there is another group here, right? And so this group has been broken into two, right? Uh, by the way, right, this, this multidimensional scaling, what it does, it tries to um, um, embed the data. So it's not a projection, it's embedding, and it's embedding the data such that uh, the two um, data objects are together if their profiles are, if, if the distance between them is small, right? Uh, so there's a vampire and fruit bed here, uh, and they should really have, uh, probably they have the same profile and there is no distinction here. Um, by the way, uh, the uh, now I can play the, with the things, right? So here, let me see. Um, I'm gonna have no labels and no jittering. So so this is like uh, how multi-dimensional scaling looks like. There are certain, oh, in of course in multi-dimensional scaling. So again, I can imply, uh, apply interaction, right? I can select the things here. Um, and that's also interactive data analysis. That means that whatever I select in multi-dimensional scaling goes out. Uh, so, and then I can observe it in data table here. Um, and I can see that, uh, um, so there are some points that are darker and this is because some of the animals have exactly the same uh, profile, right? So this is the hair and wool and they are the same with everywhere, right? There's no distinction between them. Um, um, okay, so basically I can select things here and get them out, right? But we, we've been used to that, right? So now comes something uh, interesting finally, right? So uh, interesting in a sense that uh, I can actually check where a particular animals, um, let's stick with the dolphin proper sea, sea lion, right? Where the particular animals that are clustered together in Harleka clustering are on the map, right? So, so I can simply, uh, so what I'm doing here, maybe I'm gonna show the channel names now. So what I'm doing here is that um, I'm sending all the data to multi-dimensional scaling, but for her, from Harleka clustering, I'm sending the selection of the data. Uh, and then whatever I choose in the Harleka clustering should uh, show up on the map, right? Um, and I see here uh, that uh, dolphin porpoise sea, sea lion, sea lion are here. Actually, I think there are two, um, two of the animals is here, and there are two more here, right? This is also very interesting because this is a cluster of fish. Um, so let me see. Let me say here size label. So these are basically here. There are fish. So stingray and. Uh, carp and so on, right? And I so in the map, maps gives a better presentation, uh, at least this one, um, about the relations between these data objects. Because uh, I, while here I could claim that this is a cluster, I see that some of the some of the mammals are like um, by the profiles close to fish, right? Uh, so what I'm having here now um, is um, sort of like so with this combination, right? I turned, I turned my um, uh, multi-dimensional scaling, I turned it into, uh, I mean, I, I'm having this sort of like a, a browser. Uh, so on one side, I'm having uh, the, uh, the clustering. On the other side, I'm having the presentation in the map, okay? So, so with a with a very simple trick, right? Um, so simple trick means uh, I just connected Hareka clustering to uh, to MDS, giving it uh, the selected data. I I just have this uh, visual exploration of uh, the results of the clustering, right? So gorilla and wallaby are here. There are some things here, and. This comes simply because I have interactive visualizations. So here I can interact, I, in any visualization I can interact, I can select the things here. Um, whatever I select here will go out in a data table. Um, 
oh, now do we know, right? So, so instead, I, I don't need to use Kareka clustering. I can use, for instance, uh, I can start with the data table uh, and say, oh, maybe I'm gonna order uh, these animals by name, right? Okay, so they were originally, they are given here by name. And I would say, oh, where's frog? Uh, so, and then we know already that uh, if I select frog in the data table, um, I can show it, um, I can highlight it here on this map, right? So frog is here. So now I'm, because of the, I mean, just because of this concept where I can select the things, right? I can actually, so now I have this uh, browser, right? So I can go through the, um, through different animals, right? Uh, oh, chicken is here, right? Uh, so it's a bird. And then, uh, so I can go through, right? I can even select a number of them, right? Uh, and see where they are on the map, right? Um, and this is, I mean, think about if you are building this from scratch, you would need, um, quite some effort to, to do that, right? Where here it becomes, um, so in this software it becomes simple, right? Because every component that I have, so either a data table or Hareka clustering or um, or the, um, I don't know, the multi-dimensional scaling, all the scatter plots, right? Everything is interactive, right? And then I can put components together like Lego bricks, right? Uh, I can start explaining the things and answering things. Oh, where's fish? Uh, so where is chop here uh, within the fish, right? Uh, I can do stuff, right, that I would not be able to do if these visualizations would be static or even printed on paper, right? Um, okay, there are um, there are there are things that are that are interesting. Um, I mean, I can use this kind of interaction also to explain things that are usually um, hard to explain, right? Um, let, let me give you an example. Actually, um, multidimensional scaling is just one way uh, to present this data uh, in two dimensions, right? It's just actually multidimensional scaling to be truthful, it works uh, when the data sets uh, are small, but then it gets, uh, then it gets strange. Uh, so the other one that is much more uh, known is uh, principal component analysis. So I can take principal component analysis and just select two principal components. Obviously they together explain about half of the variance. And then I will do the scatter plot, right? Um, um, and it turns out that uh, for this data set, the scatter plot does not look too much different uh, from multidimensional scaling. Um, so I have the mammals are here. They're here, right? Uh, the invertebrates are here, the yellow ones. Uh, the fish are here, right? So, okay, there are some differences here with the orange ones. So the insects, some of the insects in MDS are here and some of the insects are here, I don't know. Um, does anybody from the audience, uh, is anybody from the audience familiar with other uh, techniques. Uh, so we have multidimensional scaling, which is embedding uh, because it optimizes a cost function when it puts the data in, right? We have a principal component analysis, which uh, finds uh, perpendicular components that uh, maximize the variance. Uh, so these two, the principal component one and two that I have on display, they maximize the variance and together they explain half of, half of the variance in the data. Is there any popular technique recently that uh, you encountered that maybe different and maybe better? Anyone? I mean, I've seen T-SNE a lot. Yeah. Okay, T-SNE, right? So, so that's a very interesting stuff, right? Because so multidimensional scaling, right? So the one that I'm having here, right? Tries to preserve the distances, right? So I, I was wrong when I introduced it before. I, I said that the things that are close together should be close together. No, multidimensional scaling is an optimization procedure where you, so you, you, you compute the distances and then it tries to preserve all the distances. And then of course, higher impact is on the large distances, right? So, so the, the, the point here and the point here, right? This is very influential pair because the distance is large, right? Um, and the way it preserves, the, the way it computes the cost function is by uh, computing the, um, the square of the, the error in the distance from original space and from the embedded space. Um, 
And it's interesting, this is not how we human work, right? Because we human, our eyes, right? And also minds uh, function such that we notice the things that are close together, right? Um, we actually don't care, uh, I don't know. So I would say, where is Fibliana? I would say probably close to Vienna and, uh, uh, well, close to Vienna, Zagreb and uh, um, Venice, right? Um, but I would not say, I don't know, 7,500 kilometers from Beijing, right? Although that would be right, but, but I forget about the things that are um, outside of my scope, right? And uh, uh, for this reason, they, they actually said, okay, MDS is not, uh, I mean, let's just keep the distances, right? Let, let's just keep the distances, um, let's just keep the neighbors, right? Let's focus on the neighbors. Let's focus on the points that, if I put two points together, they should really be together if the distance is small, right? Uh, but otherwise, if the distance is large, I don't care, okay? Um, so that's a slight deviation from MDS. MDS tries to put to, to have all the distances uh, uh, correct, whereas TSD only cares about the neighbors. This is why it's called uh, um, Disney is a stochastic neighbor embedding, right? Um, so let, let me try Disney here. And um, okay, it's not it's not going to be too different from MDS and not too different from PCA, right? Um, except that if you notice, right, suddenly all the insects in Disney are close together. Um, so I would say that for this particular data set, right, um, Disney is a bit better than MDS and PCA because uh, it does not break. So you see that the clusters are somehow clumped together in a better way, right? All the, all the, light blue stuff is here, right? Whereas here I have an outlier. Um, the insects are here split, where here are close together, right? Um, uh, but the, yeah. yes, please. No, I was thinking of another possibility to, to first, after you run the, the principal component, to take, uh, let's say, uh, all of the principal components up to, I don't know, 90% of the variance or something, uh -huh. and then apply the MDS. That's an excellent idea, right? And uh, so I could do that. Well, and, and yeah, so, they think that this is something that. Yeah, let's try this run. I mean, it's um, right. So I will take all the, I don't know, I will take, let's say, so just excuse me for interrupting. So I think Felipe asked you that question and he also posed the question in the chat just to make you aware of that. Flash. I that, was um, not aware. Maybe, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, sorry for interrupting. This chat has so small icon that when I'm lecturing, you know, I never focus. It's far away, right? This is why MDS is not good stuff, right? Because it's like, if it's far away, I don't see it, right? Uh, if the chat icon would be somewhere here in the middle, I would see it immediately, right? Um, so basically, what, just to answer, right? Because we also made the, the, the scree diagram interactive, right? So the scree diagram, it, the direction is here, right? I can actually select the number of components and I'm gonna select 10 components because they explain 90% of the variance. Um, and then uh, let me see how, what's on the output here. Because I never did that. Uh, in, oh, so here I have, uh, so I have all the original features here, which I'm gonna say, no, don't use it, ignore it, right? But I'm gonna use the features PC1 from PC10. So, so all the principal components, I'm, I'm gonna use them as features, and then I'm gonna use the multi-dimensional scaling, right? Um, and the multi-dimensional scale, oh, that's better, right? Um, because it removes some noise, right? So now I have all the insects here, right? Um, I still have some, Whatever it is, this one. Um, Tortoise, I guess. Yeah. This one. Oh, it's a sea snake. And these ones are, the sea snake is with fish, actually. And this is probably the pit wiper or tortoise. The tortoise are here, is here, closer to, uh, to the, what are these, the birds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. I'm, I'm already exceeding my time, but so we are still in interactive, right? Interactive means, okay, everything, right? 
I don't know if you if you got me right, but uh, now I notice this. Uh, I cannot see you map. You map is coming. That's the second time that I. Um, so we have um, we basically have a Disney which has uh, which has the same features as you map because it has the preserved global structure and it's way faster than you map uh, this implementation. But you map is coming. Um, yeah. Um, but the results would be uh, the same. So, so basically, what I'm showing here, right, on, on the small data sets, is uh, the distances between. I mean, the differences between MDS, TSNI, and PCA are not uh, too big, right? But if I go into, um, I'm just going to change a data set and use some data set from biology. Uh, actually, this one. This is um, bone marrow mononuclear cells uh, with uh, acute myeloid leukemia. This is actually a sample of the data uh, from a single cell gene expression analysis. So it's a data set that it's, it's, a, it's a very sparse data set actually. Yeah, looks like this. So uh, there are healthy and uh, there's a, there, are, there are basically two patients here, one, um, two healthy, well, one with healthy and uh, uh, Leukemia tissues and um, it's actually a blood. I mean, this is this is bone marrow. Uh, so replicate one. Yeah, probably there are two. Pay, I mean, two people here, right? I mean, this is actually these are gene expressions from bone marrow cells uh, with uh, from two donors, and uh, there are healthy and diseased cells here. Um, but. Well, I'm not going to go into uh, domain. I'm just I would just like to show, right? So the in the MDS uh, I have this figure. Um, I don't know anybody. How many clusters do I have here? I mean, if I can, you know, I can use MDS or any data projection for clustering. How many of them I have here? It looks like two. Yeah, maybe maybe two, right? The PCA has. Uh, um this visualization okay so here it looks like maybe two right maybe one here one here right but uh there's a big difference in uh tisney tisney looks like this right uh so when i lecture on the differences between these different things i also use interaction right because i say oh um tisney really has i mean here's one cluster right uh here are at least two clusters here right there are a few more small clusters here. So TSNI is way better method to expose clustering, right? But then the question would be, okay, where are these things, right? Where, where is this cluster in the PCA? What, what's the difference between these two methods, right? And I can do simply by saying, okay, take the subset and show it in a scatter plot. And then I see here, right? Uh, I see that, uh, for instance, this cluster here, right? Are points here and this cluster here are points here. And these two clusters are indistinguishable in, uh, in the PCA, right? But they are nicely distinguished in TSNI, right? Uh, so what I'm claiming here is that with this combination, right, uh, of, um, I can also actually compare the two methods, right? Simply because I have this interactive uh, selection of the data, right? Okay, my next topic was explanation and I'll just be fast, right? Uh, uh, and, um, Maybe I go back to the zoo. So I'm going to take the zoo data set um, and have, um, maybe I can stick with Tisney. Ah, come on. PCA. I'm going to have Tisney and everything else removed. Um, uh, and then I'm going to claim, okay, so can I explain different clusters? Can I explain? I don't know, this cluster here, right? Or can I explain whichever cluster? And um, one thing that I could do, right, is just simply have a box plot. Um, and in a box plot, I'll actually send the data. Um, uh, so not, the, not just the selected data, but I can change this such that I send the entire data set here. Uh, let's see how this looks like. Uh, so if the... I can actually say, well, don't send me the selected data, but send me the entire data set here. And then the, in the data table, I will have the, um, the feature that will say no if the point was not selected and yes if, the, if it was selected, right? So if I 
select uh, clusters of the mammals, right? Uh, they would have yes uh, here, right? And um, so in this software, right, uh, I can plot, I, I can actually plot the box plot, but I can actually subgroup it by selection. So I would have it, uh, uh, I would have, uh, let's say, I don't know, so X, right? I see that uh, whatever I selected here, right? So uh, I selected the mammals, right? I will see that whatever I selected here uh, does not lay X, right? With one exception, right? Here. Which one is that? Oh, by the way, box plot is interactive as well, right? I can just choose the part of the box plot, right? Uh, and then see which is actually the mammal that lays sex, right? Uh, so here, ah, it's platypus. Okay, platypus is mammal, but lays sex. Okay, but then the cool stuff would be that, oh, okay, what are the features that most distinguish between my selection, between the, the points that I selected and the points I didn't select, right? And then there's something called order by relevance to subgroup. Subgroup is selection. So if I check this, right, I see that, wow, you know, uh, milk is the distinguishing factor um, based on the uh, high square statistics um, that actually separates the mammals to everything else, right? Because all the mammals lay, I mean, all the mammals give milk and everything else, right, I have here doesn't, right? And X as well, right? Um, so we've been here, right? Okay, type we know because we have the mammals and everything else here, right? Uh, mammals have hair. There are some mammals that do not have hair, right? Uh, and this is the dolphin and porpoise do not have hair. Okay, and they're mammals. So, so here again, right? It's just by simply attaching the things, right? Uh, like simple box plot, right? Uh, that can subgroup uh, uh, the plots, right? And then I can order by relevance, right? I can, I can actually. Um, I can actually do this, right? I can actually have some explanation of the of the clustering. I don't need uh, some fancy, some some other fancy things, right? There are of course more complex things, right? So uh, I don't know. Just to say that uh, usually today we have for explanation we have. I'm just going to have uh, another data set which is going to be attrition. So this is the data set that was constructed by IBM. Uh, that uh, which one? Um, so the data set stores the the profiles of employees, and then uh, if here is yes, the employees, the employee left the company, right? Um, and then I can have something like, I don't know, maybe I can give, maybe I do, uh, I build a random forest and I would like to explain random forest. So I would like to explain, I mean, I could build neural network, but it would take more time and precision would be the same. But here I can, uh, I mean, the idea would be to explain the random forest. And of course we have something called, uh, shape values. Um, so uh, explain model actually here. Um, so I'm going to send it the model and uh, it needs the whole data as well. And this is going to run for a while. Um, so who's going to leave the company, right? Um, Turns out that, I don't know, that's sort of, maybe this random forest, I should build it with a hundred trees. Let's see. Let's see if that's gonna be different. Okay, takes a while to compute now because I have a hundred uh, trees and I have to apply hundred trees to every point in my data to explain the model and uh, once this goes to 100 it's going to be shown that uh, um, okay the work in overtime so if you work overtime it's more likely that you're going to quit uh, your job right uh, and so on um, so this is it's great that we have sharp values for explanations like this right but often we would uh, i would re actually resort to uh, maybe to some Simpler models like I don't know. There's naive Bayesian that has a has a nomogram, right? Uh, and the nomograms look like this, right? And uh, this model is different, but it tells me actually that uh, um, actually if I'm sales representative, 
I'm going to leave my job uh, more likely. And if I'm a research director, I'll, I'll stick to this position and stay wherever, right? And then there's job level. And uh, so so I'm, I'm just claiming, right, that uh, it's very important to have explanations, um, like uh, shape values for, for, for black box models or explanations for, I don't know, naive bias or logistic regression. OK, I'm not going to have another one. But it's also possible to explain things like clustering with via very simple tools like uh, uh, box plot. Box plot was, I mean, when we designed this software, it was never designed to explain clustering, but but you can find the role, right? It's just there, you can use it, right? So it's very important. Uh, and I think I explained now that, uh, uh, so these are the workflows, right? It's very important to have these Lego bricks uh, and the workflows, and then I can use things that were not designed for a particular purpose for something new, like box plot to, uh, uh, to explain the, the clusters. OK. Um, I would just simply like to, um, because I'm now 10 minutes, um, I have 10 more minutes, I think, or maybe, maybe five, right? Uh, um, this idea that I can do the things right, um, I can, um, I can, um, read the things, measure the distances, cluster them, uh, put them on a, put them on, um, um, on the maps, right? Uh, it's very important to know that I can deal not only with uh, data tables and numbers, but maybe also with images, right? So this is, uh, for instance, uh, um, there, these are the images, uh, the molecular images of bone healing in mice, right? Uh, D14 means that uh, there was a mice that was, uh, this healing took place for two weeks, right? And D7, these are some mice um, where the healing took only seven days, um, not took seven days, but the, the image was taken after seven days. And the question is, can we, uh, can we actually uh, do the clustering? And of course, before I do the clustering, I need to embed these images in the vector space. Um, so this and the embeddings, it's the embedding uses, um, Inception version three, which is Google's uh, deep neural network, uh, but then I can do the Hareka clustering, right? So maybe I can um, measure the distances and then the, do the clustering here. Uh, uh, the distances have to be measured. I should use cosine distance here. Um, and then this is the clustering, right? And I see I have some mixtures of day seven and day four, right? Uh, and maybe I can, uh, so now it really is valuable to show the cluster, right? So this is the cluster of 3D14 and 1D7, right? And because whatever I selected here, um, I can view the image. Um, and these are the images from my, from my cluster, right? So now the things are just the same as before, right? Uh, so then now I have uh, images, right? Um, these are the D7 here. There's another cluster here, right? This one's an outlier, right? And of course, I can use the MDS here as well, right? It's just, I don't know, maybe MDS here. The MDS is here, right? Oh, they nicely. Uh, so there's this distinction, right, between day 14 and day 7. And there's some, there's some not overlay, but there are some on the border, right? Um, uh, so I can do whatever I've done before, right? I can do with images. I just used embedding here, right? Uh, and it's very simple to do this kind of thing. So even to, I don't know, to estimate where, oh no, to estimate whether can I build a classifier for, uh, that would classify me these figures uh, into, uh, that maybe I take a shot and then I say, oh, for how long uh, uh, did the healing took place, right? And I see that the AOC of this is very high. So this is, a, it's a simple problem, right? And I would call that um, democratization of data science um, because uh, it allows, I don't know, just so when we introduce that, any biologist who has uh, images can do now uh, clustering, uh, maps, um, um, classification, right? Anything, right? Okay, so I walked you through interactive data analysis. I showed you that. Uh, uh, if I have the right components, right, I can mix this interactive data analysis to put them in the workflows. Uh, uh, and the workflows allow me to have any 
combination, right? Not just, I mean, virtually any combination of these um, uh, of these components. Uh, and this allows me a lot of flexibility of what I can do, right? Um, so both interactive data analysis and workflows um, uh, help me to explain things. Uh, I can use this also in education and training uh, just by, I mean, simply because the workflows are so easy to read, right? Um, I don't need to dive deep into the algorithms. I can just conceptually explain what is happening. Um, and because this is so intuitive, it helps to, to democratize data science. Um, okay, the, um, uh, so the software that I used, uh, so, and that's the, in the title of uh, my talk, it's called Orange. Um, uh, and Orange has modules that are, uh, so, okay, interactive visualization can deal with text, uh, can deal with uh, geo maps and uh, uh, there are some specialized packages. There's uh, a lot, I mean, usually based on whoever gives us grants, right? So we've been working a lot with, uh, uh, with some um, synchrotrons and they have spectral data um, and there are, there's a toolbox for spectral data analysis. Um, so basically the, the key points here are that uh, in, in Orange, right, in this tool, we use visual programming. So simply to put together the workflows, we use visual programming. Everything, right? Not only visualizations, but every table that we have, every 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 component is interactive, um, and this turns everything into sort of like a Lego bricks for for data analysis. Sort of like a, I don't know. Uh, um, so you have bricks, and then you do. I mean, you do the pipeline, right? Um, Orange is completely open and free. Uh, there are uh, software tools similar to Orange. Um, probably younger because Orange is 20 years old. Uh, but um, um, but I wouldn't know of any package like this that would be entirely free. So open, entirely free, has about a million lines of code now altogether, a lot of documentations. There's YouTube channel with over two, two million views uh, and uh, a large user base. Um, um, we just recently uh, got two more two grants, so Chain Zuckerberg initiative that uh, will help uh, the, um, turning Orange into, I mean, will help to speed up Orange and then Google Google actually just, uh, just today in the morning, um, send us um, a contract where we're gonna use Orange actually to train kids in primary and secondary school in AI. So we will not, no, I'm sorry, we're not gonna, train them in AI, we're gonna show them how to apply these tools uh, in subjects such as history or biology or things like that, right? Uh, we're not gonna teach AI, we're just gonna show them that the toolboxes like that are useful for, for things that they do in schools. Uh, they would do them manually, but now they're gonna do it differently. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip this. Um, just to say that, uh, so we've been, in the past years, we've been uh, experimenting a lot with this kind of workshop. So the idea is how to how to explain some concepts that are otherwise hard, right? How to explain them to 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 um, to students or to lay audiences uh, using conceptual training and hands-on training. Uh, and we are now finding out that about at least 500 universities around the world are using Orange. Uh, in teaching, and this is really around the world uh, because it's from every continent, basically. Okay, I'm I'm skipping this. Just uh, Orange is free, and it's uh, the the website has the address orangedatamining.com, um, and that's it from my side. So finally, we're gonna go to where um, where is the title of the of the talk, right? To conform a prediction. So so to Tomas will not, uh, well, he will, so conforming prediction is not yet integrated fully into Orange or, so Tomas will talk about that, but uh, but we have every desire to do so. The, the reason is that uh, conforming predictions are still, um, well, Tomas probably will say, right, why? Why not yet, right? Uh, but the idea is that, yes, we could do that as well. And Tomas will talk about conforming prediction and then relate it uh, to, to Orange as well. So any questions on uh, for me? Um, otherwise, I'll leave the floor to Tomas. And I don't know, Tomas, if we need uh, 
few minutes of break just to uh, stand up and do some gym. I think, as we said before, we can have a five minute break for the audience and then proceed. Okay, perfect. Let, let's uh, take five minutes then, and then we'll start up at uh, 235 sharp. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. So, Thank any you, questions? I, I can also answer any questions during the break, but um, if there are none, then. Okay. So I, I, I just have a comment uh, may, uh, that might be obvious also from Tomasz's presentation, but I, I guess you, you can actually use it uh, through uh, the source code that you have as well, if you want to, the, yeah. uh, all the functionality. But I guess then you will be losing out on the visualization part, but you can uh, deploy models based on, on your Python packages. Exactly, and, I think Tomasz will show this. And... Yeah. Tomas, you should uh, actually share the screen. Um... So I have a question also, um, and that is regarding to, uh, I mean, this is a work, uh, primarily a workbench application, use it on your local laptop and so on. Yes, so yes. if you work with larger data sets that you usually, and you have a server and stuff like this. So what have you, how does that work out with you? Um, I mean, we have some things on the server. So let's say the, the, the embedding of images that I use, this is uh, on a server, uh, but truly, right? We, I mean, what you're saying, Ola, is that um, we, we don't, right? So Orange uh, has a complete dependence on scikit-learn, which is the most popular package in, uh, um, in Python for machine learning, but unfortunately, right, doesn't run on servers well. I mean, you, you can always run it on a single server, but that is not, that is not okay. And, uh, I'm happy to, to say that uh, Che and Zuckerberg Foundation just uh, um, a few weeks ago told us that, uh, yes, uh, they gave us money actually to, to migrate uh, to other libraries that we can use on, uh, on, on servers and on computational engines that have parallel processing and so on. So, so we hope that uh, with this, right, we, with a new, I mean, we promised to build uh, I think we promised to build a new version of Orange that's going to work on servers uh, within a year. Well, that sounds very good. Looking forward to that. OK, thanks.
I think we just uh, are five minutes past the half hour now, and uh, perhaps we should should start then, Tomas. Please. Okay. Thank you. So, hello everyone. My name is Tomas Kuchevar, and I'll continue and try to connect this presentation that Professor Zupan started. Uh, try to connect it with conformal prediction. Okay. So. Let's get started. So this is about the Orange conformal package. So as you've seen, we have extensions of, of Orange for different data, data types, such as geographical data, images, text data, and so on. And we've also developed uh, a package that provides some basic, uh, some basic tool sets for conformal prediction. So it's an add-on. And unfortunately, at this point, it's just a library that can be used in Python script. So it doesn't have uh, a user interface, which you've seen so far. So most of this user interface depends on the, on the back end. So currently, the support for conformal prediction is limited to this back end and Python scripts. However, we can use some glue, which, will, which I'll try to demonstrate here. Uh, we can hopefully in the future build something more visual as well. So just a couple of links uh, to the Python package and documentation if anyone is interested or will want to look at this, will want to look at this later. Okay, so first a couple of comments uh, on the related packages. So there are a few packages that provide some tool sets for conformal predictions. Of course, there are repositories for each paper and the specific method developed in it, but the more general packages aren't too many. So what we found was the non-conformist, which is perhaps the most, the most extensive, uh, another package for R conformal and PyCP, which was at the moment unavailable. So in fact, the non-conformist package is pretty extensive and we were actually considering extending it to fit it within orange, but uh, finally decided that it might be easier to, to start from scratch and use that as a reference instead of trying to, to adapt it. So how is the, how is the add-on designed? So the conformal predictors have very Lego-like structure. So they, they fit nicely with uh, what we've seen so far. So to construct a formal predictor, or at least a basic one, uh, you have to decide on the, on the basic conformal prediction method or sampling method, whether it's transductive, inductive, or some cross conformal predictor. Then you have to choose the non-conformity measure. So how do we estimate the non-conformity unusualness of individual instances? So these are, these are different for classification and regression. So we have a large set of, of these non-conformity measures available because uh, this package actually arose from, from a project uh, where we were investigating the effect and the usability of different non-conformity measures on mut mutagenicity data sets. So, Essentially, we had a data set uh, where we had molecular structures described by some features, and uh, the task was to model whether this molecular structure is likely to cause mutations and in turn cancer. And here we were experimenting with different non-conformity measures. So that's why we have a pretty large library. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the, second, the second component. And in most cases, there's also a third component, which is the underlying classification or regression model. So if we're using some inverse probability or probability margin, we need um, underlying classification model. OK, so how was uh, the library designed? So it was designed to be modular ex and extensible. So we are well aware that. These are not all non-conformity measures, far from it. And there are plenty of other methods. Uh, so we were trying to 
set up uh, the package so that it can be extended uh, in the future. As I already mentioned, we had a, we have a, already have a wide range of non-conformity measures, so the users can experiment with this or use them as a starting point to develop their own. And of course, we are supplementing this with various evaluation scores such as confidence and so on, and procedures to, to estimate the performance to minimize uh, the amount of programming that the user needs. Well, but unfortunately, it's still uh, a scripting library and it's not supported in the user interface. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So that this starts making sense. So we'll start with the Iris dataset. So the Iris dataset, it's pretty standard classification toy dataset. Uh, we have a set of, I think, 150 flowers, uh, which are described by four different leaf lengths. So it's sepal length, sepal width, petal length, and petal width, and the type of this flower, which is one of three iris types. It is either iris setosa, iris versicolor, or iris virginica. And to use this conformal add-on, <clears throat> we need to import orange, import this add-on, and then we can start exploring. First, we load the table and look at the domain, so just so we know what we're dealing with. Then we'll split the data. So I'll focus mostly on the inductive, inductive setting because it's the fastest and probably the, the easiest to demonstrate. So we'll just use as the training data set or as the learning data set uh, all of the elements except for the last one. And the last one will be used as a test instance that we'll investigate. We'll further split this learning data set into a proper training data set and the calibration data set. So we'll choose odd and even indices for one and the other. And if we look at the test instance, we see that we have some, some numbers as, as lengths and then the, the class value that we're predicting. So, so far we split the data set now let's try to use uh, a simple conformal classifier. So to do this, we'll, we'll use an inductive classifier and it requires a non-conformity measure and two data sets. One where we'll train it and another for calibration. As a non-conformity measure, we'll use the inverse probability of some learner. And this learner, we'll choose as let's, let, let's just pick logistic regression learner from orange classification package. So learners, uh, we use the term learners for untrained, untrained classifiers or unfitted. So once we built such, such a conformal classifier, we can test it at different significance levels. What are, what are the outputs? So for every epsilon, in this range, we can we can observe the output. So at 0 0.1, we get an empty prediction set. And then when we go to higher, lower significance levels, so lower tolerances for errors, we get larger data sets. I mean, larger sets of predicted values. So nothing special about this, just a simple demonstration of how we can use this package. And we can easily swap this for different uh, non-conformity measures, different learners, and of course, different settings. For example, transductive or uh, <clears throat> some cross classifier. Okay, now that we have a classifier, we might want to evaluate it. So we, how can we do this? Mm. So in this case, we won't just split the data set into a training data set in a single instance. So let's split it, let's use a, some random sampler and split the data set in a one-to-one -one ratio so that we obtain a, a learning set and a testing set. And then further split the learning set again in a one-to-one -one ratio into a proper training set and the calibration set. Then we can use some of the helper functions from the 
evaluation submodule to run training and testing with a given predictor, whatever it was, the one we defined previously at some significance level, and we provide the, the data sets that are used in, in the training and evaluation. And then we can observe the results, such as we can look at the accuracy. So the accuracy should be around 0 0.9, uh, which we see it is in this case. It's a relatively small data set, so that if we repeat this several times, we might be off a bit, but <clears throat> it looks OK. And then we can observe the number of singleton predictions that sets with a, with a single value, single predicted value, empty predictions and predictions with multiple cases, which in this case were none. OK, let's look at the validation. So you're probably all very familiar with the validation plot. Should be a nice straight line. So if we look at the results at different significance levels, uh, we should get the corresponding values. So just uh, some boilerplate code for, for, drawing, for drawing the validation plot. But if we look at the main part, it's this. It is a set of accuracies, or in this case, rounded accuracies, so we can ex uh, estimate the accuracy at given epsilon level for every epsilon in this linear space. So at these 11, 11 values and then plot them. So when epsilon is equal to zero, we get perfect accuracy and then we're dropping to zero. So validation plot looks okay. If I move on to regression, it's a similar story as far as our library is concerned. So to demonstrate, I'll demonstrate this on the housing data set. Uh, it's, the, it's a data set about it's the Boston housing data set. So parts of Boston, towns, uh, and what you're trying to predict is the median value of some property or some house in that town. And each town is characterized by the crime level, pupil to teacher ratio, and a bunch of other properties. So again, let's look at one test distance. So the values are pretty different scales. And we'll do the same as before with the classification. So we'll take, take just a simple linear regression as the underlying model. We'll use the absolute error of the prediction as non-conformity measure. And then for a change, let's, let's construct a cross regressor, which will use five folds and use the training data and the measure that we defined previously. OK, and if you look at the predictions at different epsilon levels, uh, we get different intervals. So the, high, the smaller the epsilon, the larger the interval. So nothing unexpected. So this was a simple demonstration of, of the library, what we can do with it. But now let's move on to how this would fit with the graphical user interface. So how can we use visual conformal prediction with Orange? So as we already mentioned, we don't have the support. So we will we'll try to improvise with what we have and add some missing, missing components on the fly. OK, and I'll change. the share so that you'll see okay i'm sharing the screen so i hope you see you see the orange canvas if you don't please let me know it, it's visible too much oh, okay great thanks so let's get started uh, so the first example will be on the iris data set so SEPA length width and the, the target value. If we look at some examples, 
you're already used to, to the data table. So nothing new here. And now we have a missing component. So to use the conformal prediction, we we'll have to improvise. And one component which allows us to do this is a Python script component. So this component will take in some arbitrary input data, classifiers, whatever is attached. And if you look at this return value, it will output a new output data, perhaps some learners, classifiers, or any other objects. And in this case, I already have something prepared so that we are not reinventing everything. So just to explain what I'm doing here. Okay, first some imports and fixing the random seed to make this replicable. Again, we split the input data in a 50-50 ratio and then look at the available values. So what are the values mm, that we have in the domain? We again, uh, define a non-conformity measure. This will be the inverse probability using the learner that we pass to this, to this Python script. So this input learner is missing. So I have an error here that none object is not callable. So I'll have to attach a learner to use it. And I'll just use logistic regression to keep it simple. OK. Whoops, now that I have the learner, everything runs. So this is the first output, which are the, va the possible values. Now we can define the significance level uh, and obtain the prediction. So for every instance, we'll call our conformal classifier at this epsilon level and obtain a prediction. So for the first example, we will get true, false, false, or mm, that's wrong. I'm not outputting this. We'll get a set. So we'll get a set of values, uh, which we want to turn into some indication variables that you see here to make it easier to use it in orange in, in the next steps. So what I'll do here is for every prediction, I'll go over all possible values and check whether this value is present in this prediction or not. And I'll obtain not a set of prediction, but set of indications whether the first class, the second class, or the third class was predicted. In most cases, it's going to be just one of them, but there should be a few cases where it's two. Okay, for example, here. This means that the conformal predictor decided that the second and third class class value are appropriate. Okay, now we have the results. We just have to package them together in a in a form that can be used by Orange, and that's an Orange data table. To do this, we need to construct new attributes. So we'll create for each value a new discrete variable. So essentially, we'll we are trying to add three columns to the data set, one for each one for each possible value. So we're creating discrete variables, one for each value. We're building a new domain, which takes the existing attributes and adds the three new ones. And the class variable doesn't change. And then we apply this domain to build an orange data table by stacking the data sets, which are the existing, which is the existing table and these results that we obtained. And this is the output data set. So this was the, the missing glue. Now let's look at what we get out of this. So what we get are three more columns, one for each, for each class value and an indication whether this was predicted or not. Okay, great. So how can we visualize this? Mm. Let, let's add another step. So let's add another feature. So what would be helpful would be to know what was the size of this predict, predicted set. And we don't need to poke around Python script. We already have components for this because it's a 
it's an operation that <clears throat> we have to perform many times where we want to construct a new feature or something like that. So we can construct a new numeric feature. Let's call it size. And what do we do? Let's take the predictions, Iris Satosa, where's the color, and Virginica, and just add them together and see what happens. So the true values correspond to ones. So if we look at the data table, we should have a new feature, which tells me the size of the predicted set. Okay, here are two, here are two, and so on. It would be nice to see where are, where are these, these instances. So I look at this on the scatter plot. So let's try to find some interesting projection. I can go through different combinations. I can use the helper function, but I know that petal length and petal width are two features which map the map the instances in, in a nice way. I'll color the the items by by their class value and the size of the circle will indicate the size of the predicted set. So what we can see here is that the cases with several predicted values lie on the boundary between Iris Virginica and Iris Versicolor. So let's make some changes and see how this reflects on the scatter plot. So if I increase this epsilon level, so I allow more errors, I should have fewer large circles. So at 0 0.1, I lost some, 0 0.15, I lost some more, and then something unexpected happens. So the, the sizes are relative to each other. So at this level, I'm starting to get empty sets. So I think it's better if I stop here. When these small predictions, let's investigate one. This one is a single, is a prediction of a single set. If I look at this one, here we have two. Okay, so what else can we do with this? Mm. Maybe we can add another feature and see which, which cases are the ones that are correct and which ones are wrong. So do the, we're in this space of the wrong and correct predictions. So let's add a new categorical variable. And in this case, let's call it correct. We we'll have two values, false and true. And now we have to construct an expression which will give an index into, into the, this list of values. Mm. How do we do this? Well, let's select a feature. Let's see if the actual class value is equal to Iris Setosa and my indicator variable. So Iris Setosa is true. And if this one is true, then it's a correct prediction. Or if this happens with any of the other values. So let me fix this. And the last one is Iris Virginica. Okay, and I'll convert everything to an integer so that it's an index into this set. Incorrect expression, where did I get it wrong? Yeah, at the end of true, you need an, an X, a, oh. apostrophe. Thank you very much. This would take me a while. And I'm still sloppy. So copy paste, just multiply it, multiply this. Okay, now let's investigate. 
<clears throat> so what do you have? Petal length, petal width was what looked nice. Let's see the colors. We can use the shape for, no, let's size. Okay, now we can use shape. So let, let the shape indicate whether the prediction was correct or wrong. So correct was false. No, did I get them just, just wrong? No, it's okay. So the circles are the ones that I get wrong and it's again on the boundary. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. Let me check the data table. This is correct. So this one is wrong because it predicts R is vertical, but since it is in fact Virginica. Okay, looks good. So to sum up, this scatter plot is a very versatile tool. Uh, we can visualize a bunch of things together on the similar plot. Hopefully not too many, not to confuse whoever's trying to decipher this, but allows for plenty of flexibility. So ideally, we would we would have a, some dedicated components which would do this better. But at this point, we're we're improvising with what we have. Okay, let's try to extend this in a different way. So I'm just double this. So still the Python script. I'll use logistic regression. Mm -hmm. But I have another one prepared, which is very similar, but allows for more than one learner. So essentially it does the same as before, uh, but stacks more results together. So a bunch, just some tiny differences. I'll run this and attach another one. Let's say we'll use the nearest neighbors as a classifier. How many? Five is going to be okay. Okay, let's look at what we get. What we get is six different columns. So for each classifier and for each class value, we get an indication whether this classifier predicted the class value or not. And now we can, for example, investigate uh, whether the classifiers agree or they do not. So for example, we can look at some distributions. So let's say we'll, we look at what uh, the, let's, let's not split anything. Let's look at what logistic, logistic regression says about iris versus colors. So we have two sets, some are false, some are true. And then let's split those by what the nearest neighbors say about the same class. And we see that they mostly agree. They agree a bit more on this true side than on the false one. But still, this just gives us just the numbers, not, not the actual feel for, for the values. So we, we might as well use the scatter plot again to see what's going on. Okay, so what do we have here? So again, same visualization, we'll color them according to what the logistic regression says, and we'll shape them by what the nearest neighbors say about the, this second class value. So most of the blue ones are circles, most of the red ones are crosses, but there are a couple of exceptions where the both classifiers disagree. And again, as expected, they're, they're on the border. We can select them and investigate which are, but not here, which are these special cases and what's so special about them. Okay, so these were two examples of using classification. And now let's try one with regression. Just put this one 
these two things a bit higher up to get some space. And let's do this on the, the housing, Boston housing data set again. But in this case, let's try to split the data before. So not let's not do it in a Python script. We have some functionality for this. So let's say we'll use a data sampler, split the data in half, and then pass it on to the, to the Python script. And let's see what we can do. So the data sample will be part of the data and the remaining data will be again part of the data. So we'll have two data sets that we'll deal with. And the code doesn't change much. So it's, it's a similar thing. So we get the input data sets, which we split into the learning and prediction data set, or they represent them. The rest is similar. And what we're doing, instead of adding new attributes for each class value, we'll add just two variables, two continuous variables. One will represent the lower bound and the other the, the upper bound of the prediction. There's not much different here. What I'm missing is the, is the model. And I'll say, let's take the simplest one. Linear regression should be just fine. OK, and it runs. I get some debug output. But let's check this in a table. So we get two more columns with, with the predictions. So it's just, it just numbers. <laughs> what if we look at this in some visualizations? So Unfortunately, we don't have a nice visualization for such ranges, so we will abuse another one. So let's first select just the columns that we are interested in. So we're ignoring everything except for the lower and upper bound. Uh, you might have noticed this, that this was already loaded. That's a helpful property of orange. It remembers, the widgets remember. Uh, what data they were used with. So for each data, they remember the settings so that the next time we're dealing uh, with the same data set, we don't have to reset everything from scratch. So here I'm selecting just the lower and upper bound. Let's see if that's true. Okay, it is. Let's, let's visualize, visualize them somewhere. Um, Let's take line plot. So um, quick fix. <laughs> so what was I was trying to show was so what's the visualization? Every every case is a single line and it has the lower bound and the upper bound marked. So what you notice is that, that they are collinear. So this means that the predictions, the, the size of the predicted interval is the same, which is, which is expected for such non-normalized non-conformity measure. And we can change this. So for example, we can take this and keep the line plot. And if I change this to some normalized non-conformity measure, so this one is normalized by the variance in distance to nearest neighbors. If I run this again, it takes a little longer, but suddenly these lines are no longer collinear, which means that the predicted sets are not the same, the same width. And they're all over the place with two exceptions. So these two look weird and I could investigate these two further. Okay, so what more? Mm, we can use the, the feature constructor to demonstrate that they are all centered around the same value. So here again, it remembered that I've already used this feature constructor to compute the average. 
and obviously these averages are the same no matter what significance level I choose. So it's 18, 8, and so on. If I change this, oops, where is it? No, it slides over, but again, it's 18, 8, just the size of the, of the predicted sets change it, but they're still centered at the same value that's predicted by the underlying regressor. Okay, again, nothing unexpected, just a way to demonstrate this. Okay, so unfortunately, we do not have any more specialized widgets. So this is what I had prepared for the, prepared for the demonstration. I'll just go back to my presentation. Where is it? Screen. Okay, screen, screen is fine. Okay. So we've seen this. <clears throat> so to conclude, I'd like to mention some ideas for, for future work. So it's obvious that we are missing some standalone widgets for conformal prediction. We don't want a, a user to play around with Python scripts and hope to get everything right when we are advertising that this is simple to use for someone who's not a, a programmer or a machine learning specialist. We would need some custom visualizations for set and range predictions. So in this presentation, uh, we are improvising a bit with what we had, but it would be nice to design some special visualizations with, which could emphasize these range predictions and, and sets. There are of course many missing methods, not just particular tiny methods, but entire uh, sections of the conformal prediction framework, such as event predictors, predictive distributions, and, and many others. Mm, we do also interesting in preparing some training material and practical showcases to demonstrate the power and usefulness of conformal prediction. And we're also always interested in collaboration with conformal prediction experts when it comes to designing this visualizations and and widgets okay that's it for me so thank you for for your attention and if you have any questions don't don't hesitate to ask thanks a lot Tomas and and Blash. Uh, so maybe we should open up for for questions then Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Uh, uh, both yours and, and Blas, it was very interesting to see. And um, uh, so I have a rather specific question when it comes to the conformal classifiers. You didn't demonstrate that, but you can also get the p-values out or do you have to specify a significance level? No, you can, you can get the p-values out. So yes, from the scripting part, this is something that the library does expose. So th this, is, this is available. So we could, we could demonstrate this and try to draw them, visualize them, but didn't come up. So we didn't have a good idea how to, how to really demonstrate this nicely. So this is part of, the, part of this last point. You are the you are the experts, and we could really benefit from from your insights. Yeah, yeah, I would be very happy to. Um, so, um, and I think also the uh, the missing methods here that you mentioned are uh, it would be very nice to to see them implemented as well. Uh, so, have you thought about specifically say techniques where you use um, bagging, where you could uh, instead of using a separate calibration set, you could use the out of bag predictions? Is is that something that uh, would be easy to implement or? Yes, I think we have. Uh, we have one non-conformity score that does this. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we have a bunch of them that are normalized according to variants of random forests or trees in the random forest and so on. And yes, we are, we're trying to add new ones. So if anyone wants to contribute, it's, a, it's an open project. So 
we'd be happy to, to accept new, new contributions. Ah, good to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so here's, here's a question. Uh, there's an error. So importing the orange contrib conformal, now it's small o, but you need to install the, the library. So if I go back to the first page, if I go to this Python package. So you need to, to install the package. Hmm, I think this one, which one will be the best? Just look at the development homepage. So pip install should work to install the latest released version, or you can download the source code and then run setup I develop. So you have to explicitly install each of the each of the add-ons. So if you're trying, if you were trying to replicate what Professor Zupan showed, you'd have to install the image analytics add-on and so on. So this one is orange conformal. It's in the PyP repository. So it's you can just run pip install and this import should work. Yeah, so just just to sort of clarify your answer that Tomas, if if anyone downloads the standard orange version, then it comes with no add-ons at, at all. And I guess you have the possibility to add add-ons through the graphical user interface. But yes. when it comes for conformal prediction, is it available in the graphical user interface? No, no it's, it's not. only available here. Yeah. Exactly, because it doesn't have the the user interface doesn't contribute any widgets. So if I show this, for example, here's the network add-on. And if you're trying to install something from the user interface, you can check the options, add-ons. And you should get a list of available add-ons. Essentially, what this does is installs it as pip install behind the scene, but the conformal prediction one is not listed here, so you have to do this manually. It would be really useful uh, to have your slides um, on the website if it's possible. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, we, we can we can make this available. Okay, it would be great. Thank you. Yes. So either on my site or on the on the conference site, whatever the, the organizers prefer. Yeah, yeah, please share them and, and I guess we can post them on, on the on the COPA webpage. But uh, equally I guess uh, we can go to your webpage as well. So. Okay. I'll, so if anyone's interested in examples of documentation should list uh, this these basic use cases. So there's a tutorial for example, for classification, which which shows some some examples, more or less what I was showing here. Very nice. Do we have any more questions? I guess we don't. I have a question, and, oh, and that's right. that. So the, I know that the, this previous AZ Orange uh, is that compatible with later versions of Orange, or is it deprecated? I'm not sure. We we're, we're not actively maintaining that anymore. So this was a spin-off by AstraZeneca, uh, part of some project. No, I don't think we're maintaining this. Yeah, yeah and I think since you've been changing i don't know what the interior looks like at the moment but uh, from what blush said before if if you're using scikit learn uh, i think a lot of things have changed so i i wouldn't expect that it would work because yes, we yeah orange has a lot of dependencies on scikit learn numpy and when we go to to other data types on other libraries so to keep everything running when these libraries are updated so it takes a lot of effort. Yeah, so, and I don't see. think that the uh, scikit-learn and NumPy were even around when AC Orange existed. <laughs> Probably. There's another question. Uh, is there a plan to implement some of the federated learning in Orange? Uh, not at the moment. 
Mm. We're always open to to other contributions. So currently, we are pretty much limited by by the manpower of what we can include. And at the same time, we're trying to include just the just the most basic and all around features, so that we don't overload the user with all the bells and whistles. So even if you look at the user interface, for example, for some classifier, you won't find all possible parameters for that classifier. So those can be accessed through the scripting part, but the user interface exposes just the most basic to keep it simple and not to scare off uh, any new users. So uh, just, just a question uh, from me around collaborations. If someone would like to contribute uh, with code and expanding Orange, what is the preferred way from, from your point of so view to do that? The, the preferred way is to go to the GitHub, uh, submit a pull request, or maybe contact me before, and we can, uh, we can get it accepted and I'll help you with incorporating your, your ideas in knowledge conformal. And does it work the same way for any contributions to, yes. to Orange? Yes, other, other add-ons have, have the same policy and Orange itself. Thank you. So uh, can I ask a quest another question? And I mean, it's sort of, can you com if you compare uh, Orange to Nime, for example. Yes. Can you can you explain the differences in sort of both functionality, user interface, and, and sort of pros and cons? So um, let me see. Is Blush still around? I think he'd be better yeah, uh, I'm here. to answer this. Yeah. So um, um, I think Nime uses compiled uh, visual programming, and Orange uses inter interpreted visual programming. That means that uh, Nime. Um, so I'm. I'm not entirely sure, right? I'm, I'm, I played with Nime some time ago, but um, uh, so I, I think the other, uh, also, also Rapid Miner, for instance, right? Uh, are software where you define the workflow and then you run it, right? Uh, whereas in Orange, you don't run it; you, you, it runs immediately, right? So, so as you, as you compose the the, the widget, um, um, the widgets together. It runs immediately, and this is why you get this uh, interactive, interactive analysis. In I think in a in a different way, right? Uh, also, also Nime and Rapid Miner um, do not focus so much on interaction, but rather on the on the workflows, right? Um, um, so on on the processing and not on the visual interfaces. Uh, there's this huge difference that Rapid Miner I think has I don't know. 3,000 or 4,000 different widgets that are much smaller, much more computational, right? Uh, uh, in Orange, we tend the number of widgets to be really small, right? So, so we rather shrink down the number. It's like Lego bricks, right? Uh, I mean, I liked Lego more when uh, the number of bricks was really small. And now you get these packages where everything is like, you can just build one thing because you have thousands and thousands of components, right? Other than that, uh, I, I, I think the, uh, Nime and Rapid Miner are better because they, they run on servers, I, I think. Um, um, but else you probably have to look at uh, the differences. Um, I mean, there were many more before, right? And now this software, I mean, Nime and Rapid Miner are companies, right? They're huge, right? And we're not trying to compete with, uh, uh, I don't know, companies that have millions of dollars of budget, right? We're a very small group, right? And um, I don't know. Personally, I think um, I I think Orange is cuter. Uh, so, but that doesn't help. <laughs> doesn't to add help to this, uh, I would say that I would choose Orange for user friendliness and the others for computational efficiency. Yeah. You should try. I mean, I don't know. I, we were trying to, we, we were asked, for instance, to compare how is image analytics in Rapid Miner and Orange for one paper, right? And then we found a library that never worked. And so depends, right? There are some things that Rapid Miner has that it's excellent, and some things that really it's terrible, right? So it doesn't mean that if you have thousands of components, right, that 
um, they all run because they, there's so much debugging. Uh, I mean, so much bug finding that, but again, these are companies. And um, I, I think both companies actually focus on services rather than on, uh, I mean, less than on developing the platform. Uh, so more on providing services in data science. I think this is the, that's what I learned that the major income for, for both of them are, right? Not by sell, not through selling, but through providing services. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Last, there's a raised hand from Eva. So. Yes. Hi. Um, so I apply conformal prediction on convolutional neural networks. Uh, could I input my results into Orange if I have them in an Excel file and then use Orange to visualize uh, the errors of my conformal prediction? So if I've already done my conformal prediction. So if you have you have the predictions, so you have a set of predicted class values and so on, or p values or whatever. Yes, yes yeah, exactly sure. in this true false manner that you just yeah. wrote that you yeah, got. Yeah, sure. You, you can you can import the, the Excel Excel sheet and work work from there with, with orange. This is just fine. Yes, that would be a good way of finding where did my errors lie. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> good luck. Uh, there was another question from Philippe. Uh, I don't know. I don't think you uh, responded to that. Uh, could could okay. we have it in Docker? I think he asked as well. Mm, so running Orange in Docker? Yeah, sure. Why not? So I just not... just avoid the dependencies and all the installation problems that people. Yeah, yeah find. sure, sure. So usually it's not a problem if you're installing it from scratch because uh, it takes care of its own dependencies. Uh, usually you have a problem, you have some pre-installed versions and you're trying to install the development environment and something clashes. So, but if you download it as a package from the Orange website, it comes with everything it needs. So there, there shouldn't be any clashes. Okay. And just, I, I believe that this is, Possible, it should be possible, but can you confirm also that if I've done develop my workflow, I can run it headless? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Of yeah. So, I mean, yeah, headless or just in, so what I was demonstrating, just importing orange in, in Python. So, yeah, yeah um, but something that is head, that was just using import orange. So, the, this is the headless part. So now you have the and access. And now I can run run sort of run uh, work developed workflow on a oh, data. Oh, you mean to run the entire workflow? Yes, you can do this as well. So we have we have some parameters to to run the the workflow. Mm, there are some problems with gathering the output. So typically, you you want to have the workflow set up in a way that at the end it saves the results to some file, because otherwise, if you're trying to visualize something in a scatter plot and run it headless. Nothing's going to show up. Yeah, but that contradicts the purpose. So yeah. So yeah. But yeah, but, we have this support. So if you if you set up a workflow, you can you can just run it and it will run, finish, and leave the files wherever then, it produces them. So then I can transfer that to a more to a, a cluster or a powerful server and run it on the full yeah, data sure. set. So sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, we're uh, getting close to the end time for this session. Um, just, a, just a comment for you, Blas. You said that uh, orange is cute, but I, I believe that you also say that orange is fruitful and fun. Uh, fine. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. We are having fun with it for, for years now. And um, I don't know. I, I think. Um, if nothing else, right, uh, it's really great for, um, so I, I mean, of course, I'm entirely subjective, right, but I would pick orange among all the other uh, packages for education. Uh, so if I would uh, need to, if I would need to explain something to, to students, to, to anybody in schools or to, to companies, I would pick orange because of this intuitiveness. Uh, um, so, and because it's, 
I don't know. It's kind of fun working with it. And it's, I'm always surprised actually when uh, people ask questions and then I, I answer with a, with a uh, structure of the workflow that I'm, where, I, where I'm using the particular uh, components for the first time in that context, right? Uh, the, the number of combinations that uh, you, can, you can use is still, I mean, every, every time I lecture, I find something new of the software we, we've been dreaming about for, for 20 years, right? So maybe that's the fun part. Yep. Thank you. Thanks a lot, both uh, Blash and Thomas. Uh, it was really interesting and a really nice presentation. And uh, we're looking forward to see more of Orange. And hopefully you get contacted by, by people in, 